Hi, I'm Professor Kirsten Quinn, and this is the Philadelphia Cultural Forum on CCP-TV, Community College of Philadelphia's educational channel. We're lucky enough to have today with us two folks from New City Stage Company, Ms. Ginger Dale, who is the Producing Artistic Director, and Mr. Russ Woodall, who is the Co-Artistic Director, and both of them are also professional seasoned actors. So thank you for joining us today, guys. Pleasure to be here. It's really, really great to have you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. And you mm -hmm. guys have a really exciting season coming up, mm -hmm. and the company is just one of the one of the companies in Philadelphia that uses both union and non-union talent, mm -hmm. um, does a wide range of plays. You do several a year, and you usually work out of the Adrian Theater. Is that correct? Yes. We're officially in residence there now. That's this will be our awesome. third season where we do um, the majority of our main stage shows there. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, from this point on, we'll probably do all of our shows there, even if we participate in the Fringe Festival or other things like that. Very um, cool. Mm -hmm. Very so it's great cool. to have a building and a place that you can call home. It is, because so many theaters don't have that. And mm -hmm. so it's, you know, and then we always know New City is going to be at the Adrian. Mm -hmm. we're, going, we're going there for their next show. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. I wanted to read your mission statement because I think that it is a really accurate mission statement to what you guys do as a company. So do you mind if I do that? No problem. Okay, cool. Um, so you guys, it says, New City Stage Company is dedicated to presenting high quality professional theater that engages audience on a variety of levels. Not only entertaining them, but also encouraging awareness of issues relevant to the community. We strive to create a stimulating theatrical experience that evokes thoughtful reflection and discussion after the play of, for all patrons, especially students. We draw our season from contemporary and classical works with a special focus on including Philadelphia premieres, plays by local playwrights, and rarely done award-winning works from playwrights whose work and stories are not normally found in the region. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that philosophy and how the shows that you've done um, embody that? I found when I started New City Stage mm -hmm. Company in 2006, we're going into our seventh season, uh, as an actor, I found myself going to lots of auditions for shows that, well, I wanted to work, but I wasn't sure. really excited to do the play. I wasn't right. like, even if I don't get cast, I want to go see this play. And I found myself going to a lot of theater, and I felt like there was a certain formula that everyone was following. Right. And as much as that might be a good business plan, I don't think that's a good art plan. Mm -hmm. And I particularly saw that we have a lot of um, playwrights who are still in the region and maybe mm -hmm. aren't anymore. Right. Um, but their work wasn't getting done. And there's all these plays that take place in Philadelphia or right. are written by people who are from the Philadelphia area originally right. or have ties to Philadelphia. For example, our second season, we did a whole season of William Master Simone, mm. who got his uh, Master's of Fine Arts from Rutgers and lives in Bucks County. Uh, we're doing Hurley Burley this uh, so spring great. and David Rabe, he was the first graduate of Villanova's master's program where I'm also a graduate of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was the very first one. He actually left to go w to Vietnam and be um, a journalist and then came back oh. and finished his degree, but he was no the very idea. first graduate. Oh, wow. And That's other, cool. and, and Hurley Burley is a, a play that received Tony nominations oh, yeah. and other uh, OB awards and other things. And it really doesn't, it's never had a professional production in Philadelphia. It's had amateur ones. Mm -hmm. um, and no also, class. I look at kind of the, the, the issues that are affecting not only the world, but Philadelphia as a whole. We did a whole season that uh, two years ago that had to do with women's suicide. Right. And the reason I did that is I just started Googling uh, suicide rates for women. I found that Temple University had done a study in 2008, mm -hmm. so this was 2010 we were doing the show, and they found that out of every major city in the world, Philadelphia has the highest rate of suicide among women, attempts, oh not completions. So that was right, a good thing, but, still, but it's tense. I mean, that's and, a huge, and I found that fascinating. And, and there was a play by Christopher Durang that I was very interested in doing. Mm -hmm. Christopher Durang grew up in South Jersey, and he, he teaches at Juilliard, mm -hmm. but he, ha he still has a house with his partner in Bucks County, again, okay. uh, called Miss Witherspoon, and no theater company had done it. Right. And it was very well received at the McCarter Theater in Princeton, mm -hmm. and then when it ran off Broadway, uh, Philadelphia Theater Company was normally the company that would produce his work, but they passed on this play, and I said, why are they passing on it? They've done everything else he's done. Right. So a lot of my mission statement comes from what are the needs that are not being met by other theater companies, mm -hmm. and what kind of shows would I want to go to, not only as a theater goer, but as a, an actor, and mm -hmm. just as a person who wants to be informed about the world. Right. Um, 
Unfortunately, I think we are at a point in time where, you know, we live in a very digital age, and mm -hmm. in many ways that's good, but mm -hmm. in other ways it's bad because going to live theater isn't a part of everyday experience. I mean, in right. the 30s and 40s, people went it. to theater four or five times a night. There right. wasn't television. Movies were were not always available. There weren't as many movie theaters. There mm -hmm. wasn't, you, you couldn't, there was no Netflix. You couldn't watch things on your iPad, your iPhone. Right. And going to theater was part of everyone, every day's life. And yeah everyone's everyday life. Mm -hmm. And I feel like um, our younger generations don't really know about that. So I'm trying to make theater, not only for the older generation that appreciates it, but for young people, particularly college students, yeah. make it part of their everyday experience. It is my belief, I'm also an educator, I've taught mm -hmm. at some of the universities around here and I'm a mm -hmm. dance teacher, but if you can get a young person hooked, mm -hmm. I'd say before they're 25, they will make theater part of their lives and they will be excited to go to it. They will support the theater. They'll bring their friends. It will yeah. be, it will be there, a form true. of entertainment that, that they go to. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But you, you can't keep doing the same formula mm -hmm. and keep producing the same thing and expect to excite younger people. Right. It's just not possible. Right, and if you're reaching that audience, mm -hmm. which is great because, I mean, as a college professor here at CCP, um, as soon as the students get introduced, as you say, to the acting world and to theater, mm -hmm. they really do begin to appreciate it immediately and start to love it and mm -hmm. want to know more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that a lot of times uh, students are familiar with Broadway or they're familiar with the bigger, um, bigger theaters and musicals and, and things like this that are, you know, very well known, but to be introduced to to some lesser known works or mm -hmm. works by local artists mm -hmm. is a really important aspect, I think, of theater. And uh, this is the second solo performance show Russ has done with okay, us. Okay, yeah. Um, Tell us a little bit about your season. Well, <laughs> so the exciting. season theme this yeah. year is the new American dysfunctional family. So <laughs> the RFK, the first show <laughs> we're doing, which is about <laughs> Robert F. Kennedy, uh, that was a, that's an add-on show. Last year we did okay. We do three main st stage shows, and we okay. do a show during the Fringe. Right. So this was going to be our Fringe show. But okay. then I realized, looking at the current election and seeing the parallels between the issues from the 1968 mm -hmm. election and mm -hmm. 2012 and how mm -hmm. almost everything on Robert Kennedy's platform has still not been accomplished yet. Universal health care, we're in the process of doing oh, that. that's right. Um, yeah. You know, civil rights, those mm -hmm. issues are still issues today. Sure. I felt like poverty. doing it. Mm -hmm. Poverty is a big issue. Mm -hmm. Women's rights, mm -hmm. uh, equality for equal pay, for equal work. Right. Uh, these are all things he spoke of. Um, when I thought about doing it during the Fringe, because the Fringe Festival is such a big festival with over 225 events this year. I know, and it's crazy how much Kind of going. at the end of the summer, I didn't want this show to get lost because I think it holds a really special place right. at this point in time mm -hmm. right now. With an that, election coming up. Yeah, the thing about theater is, unlike a movie or TV where you can watch it anytime you want, it mm. exists at a certain point in time. The audience uh, participates to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. and. Every night the show is different, not in the sense that you're changing the lines, but that the experience between the right. actor and the audience is a shared special experience. It never occurs again. Yeah. So it's I felt like at a time when yeah. we have an election where debates are very important and issues are important, mm -hmm. it'd be better. So we moved the production up so that it would be running in October right before That's the a great election. Idea. Yeah. And the other um, thing was that this is also another solo performance. So mm -hmm. we were talking you were talking about Broadway right. and how people have this idea that a musical is theater and right. it is is a legitimate it is. form absolutely mm -hmm. but there are more. plenty other forms of theater yeah. so last year during the fringe festival Russ did uh, two pieces by Sam Shepard called Savage Love and Tongues mm -hmm. and they're actually poems that mm -hmm. Sam Shepard and a great acting teacher named Joseph Chaikin oh, yes. crafted together and they're performed in, with live accompaniment. We actually had a musician come in, a drummer, who created the soundscape along with the sound designer. And it was poetry as theater, which is not wow. something you see a lot of. No, definitely And not. I had a lot of young people that came to it because we have a lot of outreach. Um, Temple University, Villanova, mm -hmm. Uni University of Pennsylvania, okay. and Rowan, we regularly have professors bring their students in. And instead right. of not just theater classes, we had a professor who was teaching a poetry class who brought right. his class in mm -hmm. when we did the remount of it in May because he wanted his students to understand that poetry isn't just something you read, it's something that can be performed. Right. Um, and in the course of doing that performance, I realized that I had this play RFK I'd been looking at, had been suggested mm -hmm. to me by a writer friend of mine, and I said, Russ would be perfect for it. Absolutely. And this is the perfect time. Mm -hmm. There's no other time when oh, it's so timely. Doing so a play timely. about mm -hmm. politics and the issues of a particular election and how they can shape mm -hmm. that election and yeah. elections to come are so important. And mm -hmm. 
I also thought, looking at the rest of my season, which is called the New American Dysfunctional Family, that what family was more dysfunctional than the, the Kennedys? Kennedy. As Kennedy. much as I love them, <laughs> there's the Kennedy curse, and there's all this other mystique. They right? are really our royal family. Right, the Kennedys. <laughs> yes, which brings us to our, our clip um, mm -hmm. uh, performance that Ross is doing. Can you um, explain to us what it's like to play this icon, Robert Kennedy? Well, it's, it's really fascinating to be able to uh, bring Robert Kennedy uh, to life, as mm -hmm. it were. Uh, the interesting thing, uh, you mentioned our mission statement mm -hmm. and, and that uh, so much of our focus is on students. Mm -hmm. uh, I really, I think that uh, Bobby Kennedy, much like Barack Obama today, mm -hmm. is a transformational figure. Mm -hmm. He represents change in a very mm -hmm. real and tangible way. Sure. And what we've realized in doing this show is that the Kennedys are really a generation removed mm -hmm. from the American consciousness now. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are these kids, the students here at this school, who know little, if anything, about the Kennedys. Right. They don't understand that this was our, as close as we came to the House of Windsor. Right. These are the kings and queens of American mm -hmm. society. And so, in terms of how we uh, how we approach uh, selling this show, we know we've got a built-in audience with the people who remember right. Bobby and want to want to relive their, their, their hope and engagement mm -hmm. with life when they were younger. But we also want to reach, you know, the students, mm -hmm. the people who Bobby was trying to reach uh, in, in the speech that I that I'm going to be doing, it's, uh, it's Bobby speaking to students in South Africa in 1966. Okay. Okay. But what he, he actually begins the speech by rattling off a, a, a list of uh, qualities mm -hmm. of, the, of the nation. He says, yeah. and you'd think he's talking about South Africa, and he says, I'm referring, of course, to the United States of America. And yeah. so it's a speech about the similarities mm -hmm. and how youth need to take control of their own future and that this world yeah. is yours. As, as they often say, you know, we're it's our world, but you, it's it's your world. We're just living in it. We're just living <laughs> in it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're, we're we're very excited to uh, bring that bring that to life. And as for me playing Bobby, I've just been very uh, cognizant to get the ideas of mm -hmm. Bobby across. I haven't done extensive research on the accent because what I have discovered about the Kennedy accent mm -hmm. is that it's very fluid. It yes. changes. It does. Over it changes. the years and mm -hmm. depending on situations, Bobby yeah. in particular mm -hmm. was born in Massachusetts but raised in New York, and he really right, so didn't. It's he like didn't have the thick album. accent of mm -hmm. either his older or his younger brother. Right. So I'm, uh, and I've also stayed away from the entire the uh, the legend of his assassination because right. there's so much conspiracy theory right. surrounding that. Yeah. And, and we wanted to focus on his life and his mm -hmm. dream and how it. Uh, how it reflects on our society okay. today, and, and uh, it really has a great bearing on the election that's coming up right now, because very there's cool. so much hope it's involved, and true. it's so involved in getting youth engaged in their world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I like that you guys are doing that, like I said, because it is education, you know, mm -hmm. is so, so important, obviously, to us here at CCP, and, and to you as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now let's take a look at this speech. Robert Kennedy, 1966. This is the day of affirmation, a celebration of liberty. We stand here in the name of freedom. I come here this evening because of my deep interest and affection for a land settled by the Dutch in the mid 17th century, then taken over by the British and at last independent. A land in which the native inhabitants were at first subdued, but relations with whom remain a problem to this day. A land which defined itself on a hostile frontier, a land which has tamed rich natural resources through the energetic application of modern technology. A land which was once the importer of slaves and now must struggle to wipe out the last traces of that form of bondage. I refer, of course, to the United States of America. At the heart of Western freedom and democracy is the belief that the individual man, the child of God, is the touchstone of value. And all society, all groups, states, exist for that person's benefit. Therefore, the enlargement of liberty for individual human beings must be the supreme goal and the abiding practice of any Western society. The first element of this individual liberty is the freedom of speech, the right to express and communicate ideas, to set oneself apart from the dumb beasts of the field and the forest, the right to recall governments to their duties and obligations, and above all, the right to affirm one's membership and allegiance to the body politic, to society, to the men with whom we share our land, our heritage, and our children's future. Hand in hand with this freedom of speech goes the power to be heard, to share in the decisions of government which shape men's lives. 
everything that makes men's lives worthwhile, family, work, education, government, they all can sweep all of this, government can sweep all of this away. Everything that makes men's lives worthwhile, family, work, education, a place to rear one's children and a place to rest one's head. All of this depends on the decisions of government, all of which can be swept away by government, which does is, which is not heed the people, the demands of the people, and I do mean all of the people. Therefore, the essential humanity of man can be protected and preserved only by government when it must answer, and answer not just to the wealthy, not just to those of a particular religion, not just to those of a particular race, but all of the people. Now, many nations have set forth their own definitions and declarations of these principles, and there have been wide and tragic gaps between promise and performance, ideal and reality. Yet great ideals have constantly recalled us to our own duties. And with painful slowness, we in the United States have extended and enlarged the meaning of the practice of freedom to all of our people. The cruelties and the, the obstacles of this swiftly changing planet will not yield to obsolete dogmas and outworn slogans. It cannot be moved by those who cling to a present or a past that is already dying. We prefer the illusion of security to the excitement and danger which comes from most progress. This world demands the qualities of youth, not just a, a time of life, but a state of mind, a temper of the will, a quality of imagination, and a predominance of courage over timidity, of the appetite for adventure over the life of ease. It is a revolutionary world that we live in, and thus it is young people who must take the lead. Thus you and your young compatriots everywhere have had thrust upon them the greatest burden of responsibility that any generation living has ever faced. There is, said an Italian philosopher, nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. Yet this is the measure of the task your generation has before you, and it is a road strewn with many dangers. First is the danger of futility, the belief there is there is nothing one man or one woman can do against the enormous array of the world's ills, against misery, against ignorance, or injustice and violence. Yet many of the world's great movements of thought, of action, have flowed from the work of a single man. A young monk began the Protestant Reformation. A young general extended an empire from Macedonia to the borders of the earth. A young woman reclaimed the territory of France. It was a young Italian explorer who discovered the new world and a 32-year-old Je Thomas Jefferson who proclaimed that all men are created equal. Give me a place to stand, said Archimedes, and I will move the world. These men move the world and so can we all. Few will have the greatness to bend history, but each of us can work to change a small portion of these events and in the total of all these acts will be written the history of this generation. Thousands of Peace Corps volunteers are making a difference in the isolated villages and city slums of dozens of countries. Thousands of unknown men and women in Europe resisted against the Nazi occupation and many died, but all added to the ultimate strength and freedom of their countries. It is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is thus shaped. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope, and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples can build up a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. If Athens shall appear great to you, said Pericles, consider then that her glories were purchased by valiant men and by men who learned their duty. That is the source of all greatness in all societies, and it is the key to progress in our time. The second danger is that of expediency, of those who say that the hopes and the beliefs must bend before immediate necessities. Of course, if we must, we must act effectively, if we must deal with the world as it is, we must get things done. But if there was one thing that President Kennedy stood for that touched the most profound feeling of young people across the world, it was his belief that idealism, high aspiration and deep convictions are not incompatible with the most practical and efficient of programs, that there is no basic inconsistency between ideals and realistic possibilities, no separation between the deepest desires of heart and mind and the rational application of human effort to human problems. It is not realistic or hard-headed to solve problems 
and take action unguided by ultimate moral aims and values, although we all know some who claim that it is so. In my judgment, it is thoughtless folly, for it ignores the realities of human faith and of passion and of belief, forces ultimately more powerful than that of calculation of our economists or of, or of our generals. Of course, to adhere to these standards, to idealism, to vision in the face of immediate dangers takes great courage, it takes self-confidence, but we also know that those who dare to fail greatly can never hope to achieve greatly. It is the new idealism which is also, I believe, the common heritage of a generation which has learned that while efficiency can lead to the camps of Auschwitz or to the streets of Budapest, only the ideals of humanity and love can climb the hills of the Acropolis. A third danger is timidity. Few men are willing to brave the disapproval of their fellows, the censure of their colleagues, the wrath of their society. Moral courage is a rarer commodity than bravery in battle or great intelligence, yet it is the one essential vital quality of those who seek to change the world which yields most painfully to change. Aristotle tells us at the Olympic Games it is not the finest or the strongest men who are crowned, but those who enter into the lists. So too in the life of, of the honorable and the good, it is who act rightly who win this prize. I believe that in this generation, those with courage who enter into this conflict will find themselves with companions in every corner of the world. For the fortunate among us, the fourth danger is comfort, the temptation to follow the easy and familiar path of personal ambition and financial success so grandly spread before those who have the privilege of an education. But that is not the road history is marked out for us. There's a Chinese curse which says, May he live in interesting times. Like it or not, we live in interesting times. They are times of danger and uncertainty. But they are also the most creative of any time in the history of mankind. And everyone here will ultimately be judged and ultimately judge himself on the effort that he has contributed to building a new world society and to the extent which his ideals and goals have shaped this effort. President Kennedy was speaking to the young people of America, but beyond them, to young people everywhere when he said the energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And he added with a good conscience, our only sure reward for history, the final judge of our deeds. Let us go forth and lead this land we love, asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. I thank you. See, that to me was really timely. I mean, we look at that speech from 1966, and we look at today, and there are so many things that are still going on from that speech right now. And in an election year, it's really important to, to get a sense of where we're coming from and where we've been and where we're going to. So I think that that, that was really inspiring, and thank you, Russ for sharing that with us, and Ginger as well. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing that I want to talk about today is your educational program, mm -hmm. Voices for a New City. Can you guys give me a little bit of information about what you're doing with that? Because I think it's a really interesting project. Well, I wanted to add an educational component. We're mm -hmm. in our seventh season. I thought, well, it's about time. And I'm mm -hmm. very yeah. much a proponent of education, particularly mm -hmm. theater and arts. Mm -hmm. I think that theater education makes us more compassionate human being, so right. I feel it's appropriate for all students, not just those who are interested in going into professional theater. Absolutely. So I came up with this idea and I thought, well, we should have a, a performance aspect to it. Mm -hmm. And then I was thinking, well, if I pick a play, then I have to find actors who are right for all those roles. Right. That limits the number of people I can use. So yeah. Voices for a New City is a collaborative effort. Our artistic associate, uh, Kevin Rodden, mm -hmm. he's actually the artistic director of that program. and okay. it's. Um, a self-created work with all the people involved. For three months, they get together twice a week. We bring in some experts to kind of help them, and they create a piece or multiple pieces from scratch around the idea of what it's like to have a voice as a young artist in Philadelphia. Okay. Um, so they also look at our season and what we're doing, and they kind of take some inspiration from that as well. But for the most part, um, we're just providing production support mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. of um, just saying, here's a play, now you come right. and fit these parts. 
Right. The other thing was uh, last year when Russ was doing the Savage Love and Tongues Fringe mm -hmm. show, I was going to a lot of Fringe shows because I have a lot of students I know who I've hired to right, of intern in the past. And what I found was the work in the Fringe, as inspiring as it was, it wasn't as good as it could have been because they were starting to get caught up in the aspects of producing. Right. Producing a show, there's so much involved. You have to hire so all the much. designers, mm -hmm. contracts, you have to organize and pay for space, mm -hmm. rehearsals. So I wanted to give them a form where they could then create in mm -hmm. and not worry about that, just worry about right. the art. Uh, I'm not against student self-producing, but there are times where you just need to go to your craft because mm -hmm. whether you're in college right now or you just finished, the learning process hasn't ended. No. So Kevin mm -hmm. interviewed I guess about 40 or 45 students, uh, mm -hmm. either people who have recently graduated from a local university or just moved here or a senior in college right now right uh, and this is the first year so I'll see how it turns out but yeah. that show you have no idea what they're gonna do it's uh, a completely right? self-created work and we <laughs> yeah. can't wait to see it and oh, the great absolutely. thing about it too is that unlike when you're doing a play when you do something self-created mm -hmm. the only uh, all they had to do was show up and be enthusiastic about it there was no script so it's not you're too old and you're too fat you know we love you but we don't have a part for you right if you have the energy and the enthusiasm for this project we have a part for you. Yeah. Uh, next year, I'm already That's thinking right. of that because with education, you always got to think way in advance. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. <laughs> I would like to do the program and have a section for college, strictly for people who are in college right now. Okay. Maybe second and third years. Uh, okay. And I want to reach out specifically to you know. College, Community College of Philadelphia, oh, uh, Temple University, University yeah. of the Arts, University Great. of Pennsylvania, Drexel, uh, even some of the colleges on the um, outskirts such as Rowan mm -hmm. University in New Jersey mm -hmm. and okay, Dolnova. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those schools are all great and really give them the opportunity to perform. The other thing is when you're doing the show, not only do you have production support, but mm -hmm. your production support's coming from a pro professional artistic yeah, director and team. So they're getting experience and they're also getting mm -hmm. a credit for their resume. Yes. It is really hard when you graduate Great. college to get that first professional credit and really start to be looked at. I know I really Absolutely. struggled with it. I, oh, I went yeah. to University of Pennsylvania as an undergrad mm -hmm. And I had a really hard time. I yeah. did a lot of community theater and a lot of part-time theater, but that first professional credit was so tough. It was. Yeah. Um, and how I got it was I interned at the Walnut Street Theater. That's what I did right. to, to really start understudying and get the opportunities I needed in order to, to start my professional career. So mm -hmm. I want to give people a platform to really help them because, you know, there's a lot of theater and a lot of art, but there's still sort of a glass ceiling, if you will, yes. that all, all young artists hit, not just, mm -hmm. you know, women or mm -hmm. minorities or a certain type. Yeah. Um, so we're going to expand the program that way, and that actually runs right after our Christmas show, so the first week of January. And Terrific. It's open to the public to see. There'll be about That's six great. performances. You All know, right. You can make a reservation the day of. No tickets <laughs> need to be bought. That's so yeah, cool. Yeah, and I mean, I'm, I'm glad free. that we can maybe share this with with the students here and mm -hmm. see if you know if you guys are interested in in looking at some of our students. That yeah. would be great. Sure. We'll yeah. probably actually start interviewing for next seasons right after this one because I want to okay. get feedback from the current students but okay. I'm really excited uh, having an education very, program very keeps nice. our company young it also mm -hmm. gets young people invested now they have a stake in the company yeah. and they can tell their friends hey here's something we can do besides go out and drink or watch a movie we can go to theater and we can talk about it and we can you know enjoy it <laughs> and make it part of our lives thank you guys so much for being here today and for sharing everything you have about uh, your company and New City Stage and what you guys are doing um, it's really exciting work, and, and I'm looking forward to, to seeing it, and I'm sure our viewing audience is as well. So, guys, just make sure you go to www.newcitystage.org to find out more about the company and what's going on this season. And thank you for joining us here on the Philadelphia Cultural Forum on CCP-TV, Community College of Philadelphia's educational channel. Thanks, and have a great night.